Um, this morning I have the privilege to share with you about baptism. And um, baptism is a very special time for a believer. I really believe it is. And like I shared about going into the water with all the white robes and everything, uh, even at 12 years old, I understood. And it was, it was a kind of a life-changing thing. I was, I was out there in front of everybody, and I knew a lot of the kids that were on that beach that were swimming. And uh, they asked me about it in school on Monday because we did it on a Sunday. So I, I understand that it's a very, it is a very spiritual time, and it's important for us as Christians. Um, but uh, there's some things that I want us to understand this morning, and Pastor has uh, asked me to convey to you um, because baptism is something that uh, some people have a hard time with, and we want to be delicate with, with it because we have a very diverse group of people. We have people that have been from so many different denominations that come to this church. Now we have people that have no denominational or even spiritual understanding. So we go from all of that and we put us all together and we can't always just think that everybody's on the same page. Amen? So this morning, um, we just want to talk about the baptism portion and what's going to happen and uh, some things prior to that. First of all, I want to talk about the essential doctrines of the church and what they are. Because so many times people think, well, what, you know, what is this? What is the orthodox kind of... Have you ever heard of orthodox church or orthodox Christianity? Well, that just means that that is the set of things that they have determined that are the important things and the things that must be. And so the essential doctrines of the Christian faith are the deity of Christ. We believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Amen? Amen. He's not a Son of God. He's not... Uh, a really good teacher, Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. We believe in the deity and the personality of the Holy Spirit. There is, uh, never in the Bible does it mention the Trinity, but we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They are all three in one. They are all God, but they're separate personalities and separate individuals. So we believe in the Holy Spirit and who He is. We believe in the ap apostolic witness, that the apostles witnessed and saw Jesus be, uh, be crucified and raised from the dead and all of the things that happened afterwards, they have recorded that in God's word. We believe in the apostolic witness. The humanity and the death of Jesus Christ. Jesus was fully man and fully God. There was no time where the God portion of Jesus was not there. He was born of a virgin and he was God incarnate at that time. All the way to the time through his death and resurrection. He was always God. And we believe that he was human, but God. He died for our sins. And that he rose again, which is the next one, the bodily resurrection of Jesus. He rose from the dead. Physically, he rose. It wasn't like something that, you know, it was just a, a metaphor. Jesus rose from the dead. Not only is it recorded in the scripture, but several other of the what we call secular historians of the day, they also record that. One of them, especially uh, that's very famous, the book of Josephus, writes about Jesus being resurrected and moving around through the city at that time of, after his resurrection for the 40 days following. We believe in his bodily appearances. I, I just mentioned that. His second coming and final judgment following. Jesus is coming back. That was kind of... First service, man, they got, Woo, Jesus is coming back. Second service was even worse than that. They just kind of looked at me. Folks, Jesus is coming back. Thank you very much. But when you have to tell people to do it, it doesn't seem as good. Um, Jesus coming back, and now we're not going to discuss when, where, how, but we understand he said he was coming back. He said there would be a final judgment, right? right? We know that. That's what Jesus said. I didn't say it. Somebody else didn't say it. He said it, so I believe it. Amen. Salvation is by faith in Jesus. Yeah. That's the way we get saved. It's not, we, we can't earn it. We can't do something to make it happen. Uh, it's going to be the way it is. Uh, Jesus said... This gift that I give you is eternal life, salvation, forgiveness of sins. That's what he provided. That's what I take. I receive it to myself. That's how it works. I can't earn it. Now, when they got all together, all the people um, back in the old times, even older than me, 
they um, brought all these things together and decided to make, how many of you heard of the Apostles' Creed? Some of you might have even recited it in church before uh, when you were, you know, in church. Some churches still do that today. But it's kind of like the rule of faith. This is like, these are kind of all these things. We put them into a nutshell and here it is. And so we're going to, I'm going to read it to you this morning. It's going to be on the screen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the flesh and life everlasting. Now, some of you might have raised an eyebrow when it says, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. Now, if you notice, I can't tell if you can see because it's kind of small, uh, the word Catholic there is not capitalized. Because the word Catholic means universal. So I believe in the universal church. I believe that everyone who has given their lives to Jesus is part of that church. And it is universal. So that's, the, in essence, what this is saying. We, don't, we are not Roman Catholic. We're, the, the, we have the, those churches in town. Um, but we didn't, that's not the, our belief system. But we believe that we are the church universal. Amen? Amen. Okay, good. Now, along the lines of this, there are some things that are not essential in church, but some things that are um, in the Christian faith. In other words, they're not things that are worth arguing about, in my opinion. And obviously, um, some people disagree with me. Um, beliefs about particulars in the creation debate. I believe God created the heavens and the earth. All the animals... He created man and woman in his own image. I believe that. Now, some people say, yeah, but he did it and God, he, he six days, you know. Or some people say, well, no, it took 60 million years. And I, you know what? I'm not going to argue with people. There's science going back and forth, and there's some people that say, this proves this, that proves that. You know what? It doesn't matter. Kind of, one of my things is, I don't care. It does not affect my salvation one iota. I'm still going to heaven. Hallelujah. You can stand over there and argue about it. Me, I'm going to heaven. I want to go do something for God. Whether or not the books of Jonah and Job are historical accounts. Now, I have preached from both of these books. I love these stories. Um, could they be analogies? I don't know. Could they be true? Could God have done all those things? Yes. So am I going to argue about it? No. So basically, I don't care. Beliefs about the authorship of 2 Peter. Did anybody even know there was an argument about 2 Peter? Very few people. So do we care? Are you everybody? We don't care. No. Belief about particular end time schemes. And we kind of got started on this a little bit. Um, rapture, no rapture. Um, if there's a rapture, when it's going to happen, all those things. You know what? It doesn't matter if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. See, there's no scare tactic involved in this life. Jesus came and he gave me life more abundantly. And what he told me to do when he gave the Great Commission, one of the things he said was occupy till I come. Which, that word occupy does not mean take up space. What it means is to do the things I have been doing. So consequently, if you're doing the things Jesus would have, was doing before he left, praying for people, bringing people to know Jesus, bringing God's, literally his kingdom right now here, Preaching it, telling it, living it. So whenever Jesus decides to come back in whatever way, shape, or form he decides to do it, I don't care because I'm ready. Right. Amen? I'm not worried about what's going to happen. I'm going to worry about what I'm supposed to do. The order of the books of the Bible or the canon, do we care? Some people argue about it. Which translation of the Bible is used from the pulpit? Some people care. I literally, in a church, I heard somebody say, if the King James Version was good enough for Paul, it's good enough for me. I'm serious. I'm not kidding. 
Somebody said if it was good enough for Jesus, it was good enough. I'm like, and then I wouldn't, I'm like, no, I can't combat that. I can't even talk about that to anybody because. Which gospel was written first? Do you care? Some people do. How often we should celebrate the Lord's Supper. Now, we do it once a month, the first Sunday of the month. And that's fine. I've been to churches that have communion every week. That's cool. When I went to that church, I had communion every week. And it was fine. But there's nothing to argue about. It's just when we decide to do it. The important thing is that we do it. That we commemorate the, the death and resurrection of Christ. Whether or not Jesus taught in Greek or Aramaic, do we care? Does it affect you? Okay. One of the massive things that does divide Christians, though, is water baptism. Because there are so many different thoughts and, and ideas about this. Uh, it started among the people around the third century. Uh, so this morning, our goal is simply this to define water baptism, to review all the scriptures, excuse me, review scriptures on water baptism, not all of them, to look at the historical background and to address the significance of water baptism. Now here I'm going to read what the ordinance of the churches, what the ordinance of the churches are, is, are. Help me, Lord. By the ordinance we mean those outward rites which Christ has appointed to be administered in his church as visible signs. Somebody say signs. What do signs do? They give you direction. They tell you where to go. They tell you how fast you should go. They tell you what's coming next. That's what these are. These are signs. They are, they are not things that are holy and, and distinct unto themselves in that way. They are signs of what we have done and what has happened to us. There are visible signs of the saving truth of the gospel. They, in contrast with this characteristically Protestant view. Excuse me, I missed a thing. They are signs in that vividly express the truth and confirm it to the believer. Now, the Protestant view and the Romanist view is different. Regard, regards to the ordinance it as actually conferred, conferring grace... And producing holiness. The Romanist regards that as that's what happened. The ordinances, they cause grace and produce holiness by doing the rituals. And we don't believe that. Because we believe that it's by grace you're saved. Not by works. And not by any little thing that you do or don't do. Instead of being an external manifestation of a preceding union with Christ... They are the physical means of constituting and maintaining this union. With the Romanist or the Roman Catholic Church, in this particular, in particular, sacraments of every name substantially agree. The papal church holds to seven sacraments or ordinances. Ordination, confirmation, matrimony, extreme unction, penance, baptism, and the Eucharist, which to them is their communion. But the ordinances prescribed in the New Testament, there are only two. Baptism and the Lord's Supper. So let's talk about baptism. Baptism comes from the Greek word baptizo, meaning to dip, to plunge, or to submerge. Christian baptism is the immersion of the believer in water. It is demonstrated in his, of his previous entrance into the communion of Christ Death and resurrection. Or, in other words, it's symbolic of his regeneration through, the, through his union or accepting Christ. Baptism is an ordinance of Christ. Jesus instituted baptism as an external rite. From the words of his great commission in Matthew 28, 19, Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And from the injunctions from the apostles also shared this. Acts 2, 38. Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of the Father for the remission of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now in this area right here, there is a mistranslation uh, or misuse of a word for. We don't get baptized for sin. 
for the remission of sin. We get baptized as a way of demonstrating what God has done. It's like when you went, go to the um, medicine cabinet if you have a headache. Anybody ever get a headache? Anybody live with a headache? Um, but you go, to the, <laughs> you go to the medicine cabinet and you get a bottle of aspirin out. And what it says on the bottle of the aspirin is, take two tablets for a headache. Does that mean you take two tablets so you, two tablets so you can get a headache? No. It means take two tablets because you have a headache. So how this should be reading is be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ because you have remission of sins. Just want to make sure we got that. You see, because people would think then that if somebody gives their life to Jesus, you've got to get them baptized now. We pray with them, then we dunk them. And... Uh, it's not on account of, it's because of. So uh, there's not a combo platter there. You don't have both of them together in order to make it work. It's not like, forget it, because only people that know construction would understand that, and I'm not going to do it. How is a person saved? We have to understand that, make sure we know. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Acts 16, 30 and 31, and he brought them out and, and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved and your household. For whoever, in Romans 10, 13, For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Um, we keep using the word saved in here. Um, it's, sometimes people don't understand the, ter the terminology of Christianity. Um, You've heard of being born again, being saved, being, you know, in the way, or a new, I have a new chapter in, my, in my, my, my life walk or whatever, whatever it is. I didn't get saved from hell. That's what people always think. When they get saved, I got saved from hell. No, I got saved from my old life. I got saved from the man I used to be so that I can be the man God wants me to be. That's what I got saved from. And my, my attention is not on a, a, a fire escape. My atten attention becomes on what God has done and what he wants to do in my life. Amen? So that's, that's the idea of being saved. I'm saved from what I used to be. In Acts 5.31 it says, Him, God, has exalted to his right hand to be the prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. So it's easy to see how sometimes people mix up the, the ideas of what baptism should be. Um, Emperor Constantine, way back in the 4th century, constituted that once he decided that Christianity was going to be the official um, religion of Rome, he said everybody had to be baptized. Because he was thinking that meant that's how you got into heaven. So he told everybody, you baptize everybody from babies on up. And if he didn't get baptized, he killed them. That's a little rough. But the idea was that uh, there were a group of people that rose up that said, no, wait a minute, we're not reading that scripture the way you are, and we don't agree with that. We don't have to baptize our babies. So um, they were called the Anabaptists. There are still groups that are called Anabaptists today. But... Uh, they, um, for 30 miles, a historian, J.M. Carroll, wrote that for 30 miles on the road leading out of Rome, there were stakes of gory heads of the Anabaptists where they beheaded people, stick their heads on the... They say, this is what you have to do, or... That's kind of rough, isn't it? Are you glad we're not like that? So in that aspect, we, we do not um, baptize babies. Because we believe that we understand the grace and the power of God and who he is. Um, God's a good father, amen? amen. And um, when it comes to baptizing children, uh, our stance is just simply this. Parents, you know your kids. We don't set a specific age to where someone can be baptized. You know your kids. You know if they understand what it means to give their life to Jesus. You understand if they've, if they've asked him to forgive them. And, and have, a, have a grasp of that in, in, in their ability. 
And if, they, and if you think they should be baptized, cool. I baptized both my children. And it was one of the greatest blessings I ever had. And um, I knew when they were ready. I knew how they talked. One, one, my one daughter was ready at five. She knew. She understood. So it's up to the parents. But the way they, that we do it is sprinkling versus immersion. How many know that some churches sprinkle? That, because uh, in the Bible, the word baptism comes from the word baptismo. We said that before, which means immersion. Uh, Rantizo is the word sprinkle. So never when they talk about baptism are they ever talking about rantizo. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. I've been pronouncing it that way in all the services. But history is not clear on how it happened, but they think it started over in Africa when people were getting so sick and they couldn't get them to a pool or to a river to baptize them by immersion, so they started to baptize them by sprinkling them, which they called it clinical baptism. And um, it, 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 later on, it was adopted by the Roman Catholic Church in the 1300s, and then in 1644, the Church of England adopted the idea of, of sprinkling people. But let's talk about, just for a moment, the specifics, the significance, excuse me, of water baptism. It is an, identifica an identification with the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 6, 3 through 4 says, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death, therefore we were buried with him through baptism unto death, and just, that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in the newness of life. We identify with his death and burial and resurrection. We died, we go into the water. We come back out of the water, a new creation. Not in our spirit necessarily, but that is the representation of what we are doing. Remember that. This is a representation. It's clothing ourselves with the Lord Jesus. In essence, it is putting on Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Jesus have put on Christ. How many of you know about putting on the arm of God? Same kind of attitude, same kind of action. Put on Jesus. We're putting him on. We're becoming clothed and enveloped in him. It's an expression of the reception of forgiveness of sins. Again, this is from uh, Acts 23. We read this earlier. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's a testimony of a good conscience. How many would love to have a good conscience? How many of you know you're supposed to? God provides them. And that water is a pure, is a picture of, excuse me, baptism, which now saves you, not by removing dirt from your body, but as a response to God from a clean conscience. It is effective because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. God gives you a clean conscience. When people try to talk to you about your past, we don't have to accept that or listen to it. Because God has forgiven that. God, God doesn't remember it. I don't have to. And I'm not going to live back there. I'm going to live going this way. Amen? Amen? It is the entrance into new life. Acts 2, 4 and through 42 says, Then Peter continued preaching for a long time. He must have been a really good preacher. <laughs> Strongly urging all of his listeners, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. Those who believed what Peter were what Peter said, were baptized and added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the sharing of meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. In baptism, the Christian publicly proclaims an end to his old way of life and the old way of doing things. I'm a new creation. If you're in Christ, you remember that? Old things pass away, all things become new. The old world system is now buried or submerged under the water, and when you come out, you come into God's system. God's way of doing things. In those days, if, if, if baptism to a Jew meant, in the name of Jesus, meant giving up Judaism and losing all fellowship of his nation with all the political rights and privileges. 
If you were going to be a, a Christian, you were no longer were, had any of the privileges of a Jew. That was tough. That was heavy. But that was something they said, I'm going to pledge myself to a different place. I'm going to pledge myself literally to a different citizenship. There are religions today that if someone in that group or in that, that um, religion accepts Jesus Christ as their Savior, their family will disown them and have a funeral for them. That really happens. So it was a big thing. It's a pledge of my life to who I'm going to serve and who I want to be with. I really believe that, that baptism is such an important thing. Uh, when I was a youth pastor, I was youth and young adult pastor at a church in Flint. And I had a, a youth group, and we had a youth choir, and we would go all around, and, and we had a little musical thing we did. And, and we were in Alpena doing kind of a choir tour of churches up in the north. And I had a young man that was in my young adult group. His name was Ron. And um, he knew where we were at. And he called the church because we stayed in the church. Just totally take all the youth out down to the church basement. You put the girls on that side. You put the boys on that side in sleeping bags. And I, I was in the middle. <laughs> and never the twain shall meet. Um, but so the pastor gets a phone call at the church. And he said this. He told me it was for me. I'm like, who's calling me? So the phone, Ron says, Pastor John, I, I, I've been reading all these things you told me and, I, and all these things you shared about me. And, and he said, I want to be baptized. I said, Ron, that's, I said, Ron, that's great. That's cool. I said, when we get back, we will, we will have a baptism service. He says, no. I want to be baptized now. I'm like, Ron, I'm in Alpena. He says, I know. I'll be there in a couple hours. Ron gets in his car in Flint, drives to Alpena, Gets there, it's dark. He gets to the church where he comes in, and um, he says, okay, I'm ready. So there was a river just down the street. There was one that ran through Alpena. And so we went down to the river, took the, loaded up all the youth group into the big old bus and a couple other cars, drove them down there, and um, pointed the headlights down into the river. I took Ron down to the river. The kids were singing, you know, choruses up on top of the, be uh, on the, top of the bank. It was really cool. And I... Right there, I baptized Ron in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, took him down, brought him back up. And I'll tell you what, the expression on his face was amazing. Ron was a good guy, but Ron had come from a rough background. And he had given his life to Jesus, but this meant so much to him to do something that was a demonstration to other people that knew him, that he really, really believed this. And he came up out of the water, and his face was just, oh man, it, was, it looked like it was glowing. And he had his hands raised, and he started singing with the kids that were singing, and, and had a great time, and uh, climbed up, up up the bank of the river, put a towel around him, said thank you after he gave me a big hug, got in his car, and drove back to Flint. <laughs> the thing is, it was an important, and it was an amazing thing. And I believe that baptism is that. I have watched so many times when people are baptized, how the look on their face, and just what, what, the realization of what it means and what they've done. And it's an awesome thing. And I encourage you, if you have not been baptized yet, or maybe you were baptized as a baby and you feel like, you know what, maybe I need to, I, I need to get baptized as an adult. I had somebody mention this to me in a service earlier. They said, you know, I, I was baptized as a baby, but I don't remember it. I'd, I'd like to do something now that I understand what's going on. So I encourage them, go on back there and sign up. But if, that, if you're here this morning you want to be baptized, man, I encourage you to sign up and to, and to become uh, Become baptized, get, get dunked, whatever you want to call it. Enjoy what God has given us. Uh, because, see, it's not a private thing. It's a public thing. It's not, you know, I'm just going to do this over here to the side. But it's, it's literally a shout out to everybody that I'm following Jesus. You know, we, we baptize people. And, and like I said, you know, in that river, sometimes we have canoes going by when we're baptizing people. And I just think that is so cool. It's how we proclaim our devotion and our allegiance to Christ. In the Bible, ritual always comes after inner spiritual reality. We do the rituals after we, after we have the realization of who God is. I want you to stand with me this morning. 
And just bow your heads with me for, so, for a second, if you would, please. You might be here this morning and say, you know what, I, I haven't accepted Christ as my Savior, and this is interesting, and I've, I've really thought about it, or I've been around people that, that know about God and have shared things with me. But I want Christ in my life today. I want to encourage you. Uh, accept who He is. I'm not going to like ask anybody to raise their hand or do anything to, to embarrass anybody, but in your heart, this is, this is what you need to do. You just need to acknowledge Him. Say, Jesus, you're enough for me. And, and I want what you have for my life. I want you to forgive me. I want you to put me on the right path. And if you do that this morning, I guarantee you that Jesus Christ will come into your life and He will make you new. It's up to you. But I want to encourage you to do that. And if you do that this morning, I would really love to, I would love to talk to you if you'd like. Or you can go back and then I encourage you to sign up and I'll get baptized next Sunday because it's going to be an awesome time. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. And Lord, I pray for those that might be asking you right now to come into their lives, that you would become so real to them right now. God, that your love would just wash over them. Jesus, I pray that you would just be with us and bless us. God, we are so thankful for what you've done and we rejoice in who you are. I thank you, God, for giving us, Lord, there's so many blessings. God, I thank you that we can be your children. Be with us. Keep your hand upon us, God. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.